In week six, we're going to study persistent homology, which is the vanguard technique of topological data analysis. Uh, so this is much more modern than the homology and cohomology that we've been seeing, and this is all about filtered simplicial complexes. So quick reminder, uh, if we let fk be a filtration of a simplicial complex k, that means we have a sequence of subcomplexes. F0k sits inside F1k, sits inside F2k, and so on, all the way up to some finite length n, which we're going to uh, which is going to be the same as k itself. So this is an ascending sequence of subcomplexes. And just to keep things clear, I will write these inclusion simplicial maps uh, as g's. Um, so this is just, uh, you know, we've seen these before, uh, all the way back in the first week of the course. And so these are uh, fairly familiar objects. But now we're going to take this filtration and attack it with homology. So um, computing homology. And now the question becomes homology of what? Uh, so with respect to which coefficients, etc. So uh, let's just say um, in dimension k, so we're just computing the k homology groups. Um, and uh, what else should we say about this uh, over a field? So if we do that, we get a sequence of vector spaces over that field. So vector spaces and linear maps, uh, which looks something like this. I mean, you have the kth homology of this subcomplex F0k. Then you get an induced map on kth homology by the simplicial map G0. And note that this need not be uh, an uh, injective map. I mean, just because one subcomplex was sitting inside the other does not mean that the homology groups will sit inside the other. Uh, and this is now F1k um, and HkG1. And this keeps going HkG n minus 1 until you hit Hk of the final step, which is, of course, the homology, the kth homology of k itself. So what we have here is just an arbitrary sequence of finite dimensional vector spaces connected by uh, linear maps. And this is going to be um, the main object that we uh, are going to focus on. And anytime you're going to see an object again and again, it's good to give it a name. So let's give this type of object a name. So here's the main definition of this chapter, um, or this lecture, really. Um, a persistence module and I'm going to add a few qualifiers to this so this is the object that we're defining but uh, this is a specific type so I'm going to say discrete um, persistence module and I'm going to say over F where F is the field that we're working on um, is a, a pair so V a of vector spaces vk um, they're defined for all integers k including zero um, actually let's use i for the indexing here since k is being used for homology um, and of course we are going to have linear maps ai going from vi to vi plus one um, again, for all uh, i in n. So basically, this is exactly the um, the algebraic core of what we got after applying k homology. But we're not going to talk about homology for now. We're just looking at sequence of vector spaces. So this looks like v zero, a zero, v one, a one, v two, a two, blah blah blah. And of course, this uh, does not have to end. Um, so you have vi going to vi plus 1 and so on. Um, 
Okay. And now if you had one of those, uh, the, the previous stories that, that ended at N and you wanted to produce this one, you would just stake identity maps, uh, right? So you, you, you uh, beyond N, so AN would be the identity map from HKFNK to itself, and then N plus one would be the identity map. So you could just keep padding by the same last map over and over to get uh, an, uh, a, a discrete persistence module out of um, this sort of uh, homological uh, finite thing. Okay, so these are um, discrete persistence modules. And um, I think the, the only warning to give here is that you have seen something very similar before when we were studying cohomologies. The warning is that when you compose these two, uh, any two adjacent maps, we're not guaranteed that things become zero. In particular, what I'm saying is that this need not be a cochain complex. In fact, in general, there's absolutely no reason to expect when you compose two maps on uh, homology that you'd get zero. And actually, that's what makes these objects interesting and different from objects that we already understand. So, okay, um, we have just sequences of vector spaces and linear maps. This sounds like a fairly uh, simple type of object to study. But if you think about it, there is a lot of information. Uh, there's, uh, you know, infinitely many vector spaces, even if you truncated somewhere. You have finitely many vector spaces and a ton of matrices between them. So this is not exactly um, simple to understand um, if, you're, if you're trying to study these sequences. So our goal here is to try and understand these sequences of vector spaces uh, by, by, by replacing them with much simpler ones which carry the same information. So to make all of that precise, uh, we need to define a few categorical notions. So what does it mean for uh, to break one of these persistence modules down into simpler modules, what are simpler modules, and uh, what does it mean for them to be the same when you break them apart? So, um, so here are um, basically three rapid-fire definitions of um, uh, we, we, none of which should be surprising. Um, so here's the first one: um, a morphism. So let's call it phi from one of these persistence modules. I guess I'll stop decorating uh, things to another persistence module. Is a linear map, uh, is a family of linear maps rather. Phi i from v i to w i so that the obvious thing happens, the evidence squares commute. So now that we're all expert algebraic topologists, um, we have a feeling for what it takes to get a good notion of morphism. So stick the source persistence module up here. So there's A0, A1, A2. Stick the target persistence module down here, Ws, uh, that keeps going. And so the important stuff is these maps, phi 0, phi 1, phi 2. And um, the, the requirement here is that each square you get with um, two red vertical arrows and two black horizontal arrows, each of those squares commutes. Um, so this was exactly the notion of morphisms that we had for cochain complexes. But again, uh, now you're allowed to go two steps over horizontally and not get zero, which is new and different. Okay, so this is um, this is a morphism. And so uh, when is it an isomorphism? Remember, we want to tell when two persistence modules are uh, carry the same information. We say this is an isomorphism. This is an isomorphism. If again the natural thing happens, if every uh, vertical map is invertible, and here invertible is in the sense of usual, you know, map of linear spaces. So this would require the dimensions of VI and WI to be the same, for instance, and then some invertible um, n by n matrix between them, where n is that common dimension. Uh, okay, so that's A. Uh, the next thing we need is um, how to build 
to, uh, how to decompose a persistence module into other persistence modules. Uh, and so a direct sum, that's how we're going to do it. Or really, I should say the direct sum of persistence modules um, VA and WB is the new persistence module which um, I, I don't think anyone should get prizes for guessing what this one looks like. I mean, this is you stick direct sums of uh, the respective vector spaces. So in the, the direct sum, the zeroth ones, the first ones, um, and so on. And now we have to decide what goes um, uh, what goes over uh, for, for all the linear maps. And so we can just write the matrices as A0, so diagonal matrices, uh, block diagonal matrices is really what I mean, and and so on. So, I mean, this is not um, super exciting in the sense that um, this is completely decoupled. I mean, there's V doing its own thing, and then in separate coordinates, W doing its own thing. So, um, so let's write this as the direct sum as um, V direct sum W, A direct sum B. So this is the new persistence model, and A direct sum B is a shorthand for this block matrix uh, structure on the maps. Okay, so um, our notion of um, what is a simple, you know, uh, a sort of um, the the most elementary object uh, in in this category of persistence modules are ones that don't uh, admit any interesting direct sum decomposition. So a persistence module. is indecomposable. That's what we say. So let's give this persistence module a name. Uh, I like I for indecomposable. And we've already used A and B for maps, so let's use C for its maps. Uh, if um, it admits no interesting direct sum decompositions. Okay, so I guess we should be a little bit more specific about what we mean by interesting, uh, interest lying in the eye of the beholder and all that. So what this means is that any time you have uh, a direct sum uh, of this type, uh, one of the factors is already uh, isomorphic to IC. And the other is zero. So the zero module is the one that has zero for all the vector spaces and therefore zero for all the linear maps. And this uh, squiggly thing is uh, the usual universal sign for isomorphism. So any time you have i being uh, uh, isomorphic to a direct sum, that cannot be interesting. That's the definition of why i is indecomposable. Any time you have such a thing, one of those pieces is already isomorphic to i. And the other one is garbage. It's just zero, so it carries absolutely nothing uh, new. And it takes a little bit of work uh, to uh, to identify all the indecomposable uh, persistence modules of this type. So uh, before getting to that, um, actually, well, we can just we can we can define them next. So um, let's see. Um, persistence modules of the following type are indecomposable. So this is what they look like. So there's um, uh, you, you know, you need you need i zero, i one, i two, um, i i, i plus one, uh, 
this keeps going ij ij plus one etc so um so this is what um the uh, this is an interesting family of indecomposable persistence modules so you take some i less than j Um, and basically, um, in the highlighted region, you put one-dimensional vector spaces and linear maps. So this sequence is going to be your vector space, identity map, vector space, identity map, all the way, identity map, vector space. So that's what is going to be in the red region. And then everywhere else is, uh, is zero. So zeros everywhere else, uh, except between i and j in that interval. And uh, of course, in order to get everything, we allow j to equal infinity. So, um, so we should give a special name to these modules. Um, these are called the interval modules uh, and we'll write them as i and then decorate with the interval on top so in this case it was ij and remember j can equal infinity and so um, how should one try to prove this uh, the way to do that is to assume there exists a direct sum decomposition. So you have i, i, j, c, i, j is a direct sum of some v and w. And so what's going to happen is you start at index i, and what you're going to get is um, there's a direct sum. So you have f uh, and then depending on whether j is bigger than i or not, uh, there's some vi plus, well, sorry, i, i plus 1, which um, this can either be 0 or f, depending on j. So if j was equal to i, then this would be 0. If j was bigger than i, then it would be. Um, okay, and everything to the left is 0, and everything to the right depends on j. And here you have uh, vi direct sum wi the i plus 1 direct sum wi plus 1. And you keep going. And the fact that there is an isomorphism means that we have some invertible linear maps here. And the minute you have such a diagram, um, what, this, what this forces you to do is realize that the direct sum over here has, you know, the sum of those must be uh, one dimensional. So one of them is f, the other one is zero. And the minute you make that choice, um, um, you know, just let's say without loss of generality you made vi equal to f and wi equal to zero um, or isomorphic to f it doesn't matter so much the minute you do that then um, uh, that sort of sets because this square has to commute that sort of decides the fate of uh, of v and w so whichever one you choose will end up being isomorphic to i and the other one is forced to be zero and of course to the left in order to preserve isomorphisms you must have zero so that's the argument um, so let me just write that down. Choosing without loss of generality vi to be f and wi to be 0. And continuing by induction completes the proof. I mean, the, I guess the important factor here is that there's a matrix here, a, i, b, i. And um, the minute you force wi to be zero, the map bi also has to be zero. So if the top horizontal arrow um, is not uh, it, is, is the identity map, then ai has to be um, also invertible. And so vi and bi plus one will be both f, and that will keep going until you hit j. Okay, so these are in decomposables. Um, it takes a little bit more work to show that these are the only in decomposables, and we're not 
going to do that. It's not really necessary, but it's a, it's a cool fact. That these are the only ones. Everything else can, can decompose uh, into a direct sum. So, um, okay, with that out of the way, here's the main theorem um, of this lecture. So this is the structure theorem. Um, and in order to use the structure theorem, or in order to satisfy the hypothesis of the spectral uh, of the structure theorem, uh, we need a little bit more than we have. So assume that V A is finite type. So this means two things. Um, so the first one of these two things is that. Uh, the dimension of vi is less than infinity for all i, which means just, you know, literally every vector space that shows up is finite. Um, and it also requires ai from vi to vi plus 1 uh, to be an isomorphism uh, of vector spaces for all i sufficiently large. So after a while, the vector spaces just become constant copies of the same uh, vector space. Um, so these are sort of, uh, um, you know, you, you cannot have infinite amounts of information in, uh, in, in a finite type persistence module. And so these are the ones that we have a nice structure theorem for. Um, then there exists um, a multiset, uh, so let's just say a set of intervals, which we'll call bar V, A. Um, so what sort of intervals like ij um, where i is any natural number and j is any natural number union uh, infinity for j bigger than or equal to i so this sorts of intervals um, and a multiplicity function so each of these intervals is given a multiplicity mu from bar v a to the set of natural numbers positive okay so there exists some finite collection of intervals so i should say finite um, and this multiplicity function so that our persistence module v a is isomorphic to a direct sum of ij in this set bar of the uh, indecomposable the interval module iij cij which occurs with some power some multiplicity so there might be you know some finitely many copies of it which we'll write as mu ij so that's the multiplicity function which is one or more uh, this is essentially unique essentially unique meaning up to isomorphism. You can reorder the ij that show up in your bar, but that's about it. So this is an extremely powerful theorem. It is saying that all of these persistence modules of finite type as defined in the statement of this theorem uh, can be defined by a set of, a finite set of intervals and each of them occurring with some multiplicity. Um, and this is absolutely amazing for several reasons. The first reason, of course, is that uh, it allows us to describe up to isomorphism um, any persistence module uh, as a direct sum of these uh, very, very uh, simple types, the ones that cannot be further broken up. And what's really nice is that this is purely combinatorial information. So you don't require the structure of a linear map and so forth. So. Um, I'm going to try and talk through the proof of this before um, before we end the lecture, and I'd just like to warn you that uh, that if you haven't taken abstract algebra before, this proof might be um, uh, unenlightening. But we will uh, we will see uh, helpful information after the proof. So um, here's the proof. So since V A is finite type. There exists some n large enough so that um, a, a i is um, an isomorphism 
for all i bigger than n. So we can just forget everything that happens after n. So we just consider this a0, v1, a1, etc., and then we stop at vn. Um, now define the direct sum of all the vector spaces here. And consider the linear map T that sends each vector V0, V1, uh, Vn. So this these are little Vs living in the big vector space, big Vs, uh, to zero, and then it applies the first map to the first vector, and then def you you definitely get something in V1, and you apply v1 a1 to v1 and then you get something in the vector space v2 all the way until you get a n minus 1 v n minus 1 and then v n gets discarded um okay so this is um an action of uh, so you can you can take powers of this is basically the point and now um v is an ft module this action gives you um, the ability to take any polynomial in T with coefficients in your field and produce um, uh, a new vector in this uh, vector space V. And um, FT is a principal ideal domain. What that means is that you can take, um, well, it's, it's better than that. It's, an, it's a Euclidean domain. So you can, you can take two polynomials in the single variable T and then you can compute their quotients and remainders, which means you can do matrix operations uh, on matrices that are basically polynomials in T with coefficients in the field F. And by an algorithm that's very similar to Smith normal form. Um, so let's write that since FT is a principal ideal domain, FT modules decompose uniquely um, into two parts. So this V is going to decompose into two parts, uh, T and F, um, which is not true and false. It's torsion and free. So this is the torsion part, and that's the free part. Okay, and so um, F looks like a direct sum over i so various choices of i of the free module so uh, t to the i ft um, for some uh, i mean not all i bigger than zero so there's some indexing set i and um, these uh, each sum add in this direct sum decomposition contributes a bar so each sum n, let's say it this way, is by our dictionary that takes um, uh, these um, uh, sequences of vector spaces to uh, FT modules and back. So each piece here is uh, equivalent to I this um, uh, indecomposable. Uh, persistence module. Similarly, the torsion part, uh, it looks like a co um, so for various choices of i less than j, it's going to look like these free parts divided by uh, an ideal, a homogeneous ideal. So, uh, and this sum n is equivalent to um, i i j c i j so uh, that's the that's all you need because we were able to impose the structure of an ft module on uh, on a persistence module we um, can use the classification theorem for such finitely generated um, ft modules so i should say that this theorem only works uh, for finitely generated 
And this is where all the vector spaces having finite dimension is absolutely crucial. So we use the finite typeness both times. One is to reduce to this n, and the other time is to make uh, uh, v a finitely generated FT module. Um, anyhow, so um, that's that's the theorem, and this may be extremely depressing if you wanted to sort of get a real grip of what was going on. In order to do that, you'd have to basically compute Smith normal form of a matrix with entries being polynomials in T, and that's entirely too annoying. Um, but anyhow, um, this is the, the structure theorem for, um, for persistent uh, modules of finite type. Uh, and now we are able to extract the finite data that we wanted from them. So uh, what is the upshot? If, whether we like this theorem or not, upshot is um, every persistence module of finite type is completely characterized up to isomorphism by a finite collection of intervals bar v a and their multiplicities mu so sending each to some okay and this combinatorial data is called the barcode of V. Um, okay, so the the theorem above, the, the structure theorem, does not give us any nice way of actually computing the barcode um, if, if someone just hands you a sequence of vector spaces. And like I said, to actually do that, you need to um, row reduce and column reduce uh, polynomial matrices, which is no fun. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the case that is of maximal interest to us, which, you know, you go all the way up, remember where we started. We started with a filtration of a simplicial complex. For this case, um, you're guaranteed to get, for each homological dimension K, you are guaranteed to get um, this type of finite type module. And these we can compute all at once using a very, very slick and efficient algorithm that you could write down in a computer if you wanted. So instead of trying to do uh, all of this decomposition for an arbitrary uh, persistence module, we're going to describe an algorithm in the next lecture, which does exactly the case that we uh, care about the most. So I'll see you there.